Some people say, I was born too late, or I was born too early. I don't, because I know I was born just in time to grow up alongside Gran Turismo. GT 2, 3 and 4 were the only entries I got to play in the 2000s, but I've collected nearly all the rest and spin-offs like Tourist Trophy since then. In 2010, I became a teenager and was introduced to the PS3 with Gran Turismo 5, which I played probably every week for three years until Gran Turismo 6 came out, which I finished in a week but kept playing for years, all the while wondering what GT 7 and 8 would be like on PS4. What's this? G'day there, I'm Snake of Bacon, and this is Gran Turismo Sport. Released 46 months after Gran Turismo 6, it has shockingly been another 46 months since GT Sport launched. And as the game enters the fifth and final year of its protracted life, it's time to review it. For starters, the driving is excellent, fun, tactile and immersive, and visually, this compressed 30fps video can't do the game justice. It's a 60fps experience, it's got high dynamic range, and it's got heaps and heaps of problems that stem from it being not a game, but a sport. Because it's a sport, it requires a permanent internet connection to do basically anything. You can't save the game offline. Because it's a sport, it's mainly focused on racing cars and launched with less than 50 road cars. Updates over the game's life cycle added well over a hundred more, but it's still a very race car focused game and still extremely online focused. So online focused that it launched without a GT League mode, and when they added one in you still have to be connected to the internet just to earn credits. There's nothing to do with the credits anyway, because you get cars given to you for free, there's no progression system, they come from a random lottery, there's no tuning shop anymore. I will continue this rant later, but for now, how about a little bit of the opening movie? In its original intro, it began with the laser scanning of Umberto Boccioni's unique forms of continuity in space. And this 180 year old sculpture, which still looks futuristic because it's a futurist sculpture, is the symbol of the game. There's no context given, so the average layperson will say, what is this windswept armless man and why is it Gran Turismo? And a coffee table book owner will say that it represents the rejection of old art and the embrace of raw mechanical power and strength in the early 20th century. Yeah, okay, but look at this! A montage of footage from a bygone generation, when steel beasts roared through the land with no safety equipment, the Mercedes-Benz W196 and 300 SLR made famous by Juan Manuel Fangio and Sir Sterling Moss are two of the many cars featured in this intro that you cannot drive in GT Sport. You can drive the Alpine A110, it's in the game, but there's no snow to drift it on. And you can drive the Audi Sport Quattro S1, but not this exact one that was in GT6, only the Pikes Peak model. And you still can't drive it up Pikes Peak. But this intro is not about the content of GT Sport. It's about the history and the spirit of motorsports. Beautiful as it is, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, because it's not very relevant to my review. I'm going to skip the tear-jerking emotional crescendo and go into the second half. Two minutes later, we're in the familiar CG world of Gran Turismo. The safety car is driving around at dawn, the monorails are going to work. Uh, well, they're already at their place of... Never mind. The music by Jean Paisano is slowly building into something. The cars are driving around, getting ready to race. It's still the early morning. Have you gotten the visual metaphor yet? It's very subtle. I think they're trying to say it's a new dawn for the franchise or something. It's a new day. Wake up. The new morning of Gran Turismo. Last night was bin night and we threw out a thousand cars and countless beloved track locations. I mean, driving is for everyone. Wow, what a profound statement. Is it just about Gran Turismo's enduring popularity or a celebration of the fact that around GT Sports release, Saudi Arabian women gained the right to drive? I'm not sure, but alright, driving is for everyone. Everyone likes Gran Turismo because it's got all your favourite cars, right? We've got Group 1 racing and Group 4 racing and Group 3 racing. How about non racing machines? We've got the. Ooh, the Honda 2 and 4 powered by RC213V. Oh, look, a Camaro. And we've got Group 3 racing. And we got, uh. we got Group B rally. Ooh, and Group 3 racing. And Group 1 again. So, this isn't your typical Gran Turismo game. You don't buy a PT Cruiser or a Honda City Turbo and upgrade it and keep on racing to earn more money to get a better car. This is Gran Turismo Sport, the real 
always online, esports focused, qualify well and try not to get punted off the course simulator. How did we get here? Why did we get here? Gran Turismo is a series with massive casual appeal. So why? Why on earth? Why the blueberry muffin? Was it decided to make the next Gran Turismo game after 6 a complete departure from everything else in the series focused entirely on online competitive multiplayer sprint races held every 20 or 30 minutes? I don't know what the line of thinking was that led to this point. Was it... People have complained about the offline experience in GT5 and 6. A surefire way to fix this is by removing the offline experience. Or was it... GT Academy is going well and now we're friends with the FIA. They certified our real world tracks to tell us how real they were. So why don't we buddy up with them and uh, stop doing GT Academy and replace it with this sort of real FIA certified racing championship. Right, but most people play anyone offline. Anyone and... 7 to 77 can play. This kid, that guy, anyone younger than Robert De Niro. That appeals to everybody. And look at our Mazda Roadster. It's the mazda roadster you've ever seen. It's got physically based rendering. Must say, these car graphics are top notch. Look at that Fanino too. So I won't tell you much about what the next Gran Turismo is about, but it'll have a championship so the best 48 players in the world can represent their country and race for a golden egg. Or, or maybe a windswept armless man. Either way, at Paris Games Week 2015, we knew Gran Turismo Sport was coming. That it would be like a 7 prologue, but a bit bigger and it would evolve and have online racing. At E3 2016, we knew it was delayed. And at E3 2017, we knew how it felt about nostalgia. We first met along the Straits of Grand Valley. Ah, good old Gran Turismo We've 1 been and 2. Ever since. We are the sons and daughters of Chicane and Chassis. Card carrying members of the 200 mile per hour club. They don't give you a card, but... The haters dismissed us as armchair racers and said our game wasn't a sport. What haters? F1 fans? Then, we filled the podium at Le Mans. And that's quite an accomplishment. Going from Gran Turismo players to real racers, GT Academy winners Jan Mardenborough and Lucas Ordonez have made it to the podium at Le Mans. But Florian Strauss and Wolfgang Wright, other GT Academy winners, won the Bathurst 12 hour! Bathurst! But something changed. The game became less about competition and more about collecting cars. Today we say, we want change. We want change, said the trailer voice. Well, your argument is invalid, Mr. Trailer Voice, because Gran Turismo didn't suddenly become about collecting cars. The genre it created is about collecting cars. It's a car RPG, or car PG. You start with 10,000 credits, buy a cheap car, tune it up, win races, get more credits, buy more cars, win prize cars in races. It's a game about collecting an abundance of cars and racing them. Secondly, false dilemma. Collecting cars and competition don't compete with each other. They're not mutually exclusive or even relevant to each other. There can still be great competitive racing and hundreds and hundreds of cars. Thirdly, what is the competition you're referring to? If it's online competitive racing, which GT Sport turned out to be all about, that had never been tried before. It was never all about online competition, that's a new thing. If it's offline competition, that's a fault of the AI just being too slow in 5 and 6. They break too early, and they're spread too far apart. There's no grid starts or qualifying, but that's not related to collecting cars. That's just poor design, slow AI. Let's burn it to the ground. Start from scratch. Burn it to the ground. Start from scratch. I mean, that's... Those are strong words, trailer, but... It's about the standard cars, isn't it? GT6 has a huge collection of cars, but 796 of them are still PS2 models from GT3, 4, and PSP. And, oh yeah, rest in peace, those. They're going to be burned to the ground. But... Oh well, you mean you get that. It happens. They they had to go at some point, didn't they? Or is that not what this is about? Build something worth racing for. Yeah, what's worth racing for? Manufacturer. Oh no, not this again. Nation. Pride. 
Oh, so entertainment, relaxation, escapism, fun, are things not worth racing for anymore because we can race against people through the internet? This is real racing. Driver versus driver. Human against human. This is a chance to get better, stronger, faster. I can do that in time trial mode. Because we don't want just another game. We want sport. Do we? I wanted another game, personally. I just wanted another Gran Turismo game, but better. Could that not be arranged? Join the human race. Oh, okay, all my racing before wasn't valid. I'm not a human unless I... Ah, oh, whatever. I had no interest in joining the human race in October 2017. I was still playing Drive Club and Forza Horizon 3. By July 2019, I couldn't stay away from Gran Turismo Sport any longer, though. And it had received quite a lot of updates. This Enzo and Monza, they weren't in the game at launch. They were added in free updates. Gran Turismo Sport received major content updates nearly every month for 26 months. The last of those major content updates brought Laguna Seca Raceway and seven cars. Polyphony is now busy making Gran Turismo 7, which could be out before Avatar 2. So there were six cars in 2020 and only one car added so far in 2021. More cars may come, but I think this is it for tracks. So, at launch, there were six real-world locations. Brands Hatch, Willow Springs, the Nürburgring, Interlagos, Suzuka, and the only track that matters, Mount Panorama Bathurst. And if it wasn't the only track that matters, it wouldn't be the only track on the cover. Well, we take a look at this. Gran Turismo Sport, real driving simulator. It's got Bathurst, just like GD6 had Bathurst. Oh, look at you. Forza 6 has Bathurst, just like Forza 5 had Bathurst. And we got V8 supercars. Yeah, and? You got, like, one old AU Falcon from, like, GD3. Nah, they, they got rid of the standard cars, mate. Nah, you got nothing. Yeah, we, we, no, we got, we got all the beautiful cars, mate. Best photo Less mode. Less than 200 beautiful. at launch. Yeah, they're adding more with updates, mate. We got Holdens. Mate, all your Holdens are DLC. Well, yeah, the old ones are, but like we've got ten new V8 supercars. Yeah, and, but like, every car you've got plus heaps yeah, more. But, yeah, no, nah, you you haven't got the Honda two and four. What's a Honda two and four? Nah, it's a uh, Honda's project thing, right? It's a really lightweight car. It's got a MotoGP bike engine. MotoGP in it. engine in a car. Yeah. Yeah, but cars are still heavier than bikes, mate. So it'd be like a bike. Yeah, where's your bikes? You don't have bikes. Yeah, but you don't have bikes. Yeah, but we made uh, Tourist Trophy, best bike game ever made. Yo, where's your tourist trophy too, mate? Dunno. Dunno? Yeah, of course you don't know. They're not gonna make tourist trophy too. They forgot how to do bikes. Glass houses, mate. Glass houses, mate. Shampoo, where's your mate? Of bikes? You can't you even got do bikes, bikes either. Anyway, six real world locations is not a whole lot. But updates throughout 2018 included the additions of Monza, Tsukuba, Le Mans, the Red Bull Ring, Fuji, and unexpectedly, Catalonia. In 2019, there was also Autopolis, the all-caps racetrack you didn't expect, and Goodwood Circuit, and finally, Spa and Laguna Seca as the game reached its second birthday. So there were six real-world track locations at launch, and 16 26 months later. It's excellent that so many real-world tracks were added, but unfortunately, Twin Ring Motegi, Silverstone, Cote d'Azur, Daytona, Indianapolis and Ascari do not return from GT6. Daytona should be back in 7, and hopefully all the rest as well, but not confirmed yet. Three and a half of the 16 locations are new. Catalonia, Interlagos and Autopolis are new to the franchise, while Goodwood had the Hill climb in six, and now the circuit in sport, but no hill climb. In other track variations news, we've lost 80s Brands Hatch and 80s Monza that were added to GT6, but we've gained Horse Thief Mile. And at the Nürburgring, there's a new tourist layout with some cones on the Nordschleife, but the Sprint Strecker, or GP slash D, and Nürburgring Type V have been removed for some reason. Type V, the four hour layout, is my favorite. It's the underappreciated Nürburgring. But enough about Nürburgrings. Gran Turismo's original circuits have always been its greatest strength, and GT Sport launched with 11 original track locations, all new to the franchise. Do you need a moment to unpack that statement? All new original circuits means none returning. 
What if you liked Circuito de la Sierra? Or the Matterhorn, or Eiger Nordwand, or Cape Ring from the PS3 games? They're gone. Tokyo Route 246 has been in every Gran Turismo since number 3. Now it's gone. And the tracks core to Gran Turismo's identity are nowhere to be found. Special Stage Route 5, High Speed Ring, Deep Forest, Grand Valley, Trial Mountain, Apricot Hill, Midfield, and Autumn Ring. Tracks with a 20 year, 3 generation history. Every numbered Gran Turismo game has had 6, 7, or 8 of those 8 tracks. Gran Turismo 6 certainly had all 8, and 2 of them were newly remodeled. They just remade Midfield and Apricot Hill, and they're gone again? I don't understand. I don't understand how they went from saying cherished classic circuits from GT history to let's burn it to the ground. Well certainly that's how it feels having a Gran Turismo game without the Gran Turismo tracks I know. But of course there are new original circuits. We have Autodrome Lago Maggiore which should be an Autodromo being Italian. Either way it's Fantastic. It's a great new GP circuit. It's part Imola, part Mugello, and a little sprinkle of Dinosaur Canyon from Daytona, USA. This massive sweeping right-hander is so nice. Alsace Village is made mostly of relaxing second and third gear turns throughout the rolling French hills, and one terrifying downhill blind chicane of death at the end. In reverse, the chicane is very easy, and all the other corners are more difficult. Broad Bean Raceway is sort of an oval, but not really, because it has a square left and also a little kink on the other side. It's more of a baby Brooklands. Blue Moon Bay is an oval. NASCAR fans rejoice. It's basically Pocono. NASCAR fans despair. There's no NASCARs in this game. Updates added a challenging road course and a smashing fun roval layout, though. Dragon Trail Seaside has, besides amazing views of this big Croatian mountain, a lot of depth and it's a bit like racing Spa and Monaco at the same time. Dragon Trail Gardens is much more compact and technical, and its great big concrete Not bits just really make me miss Red Rock Valley. The lush and picturesque Kyoto Driving Park features Yamagiwa, which is a bit like Apricot Hill, but actually, no, it's nothing like it, and Miyabi, which is a short beginner's track, and a big combined circuit as well. Sardinia Windmills is reminiscent of GT4's Cathedral Rocks Trail 1, but not quite as tight and twisty. It's probably the track best suited to the Group B cars in the game. Colorado Springs Dash Lake is all corners. There's no room for a Group B car to accelerate. Much better suited to minis, really anything with less than 200 horsepower. Fisherman's Ranch is the third and final track in the dirt slash snow section. Yeah, there's no snow tracks. And the, all the dirt ones are fish themed. Hmm. It's 6,893 metres of American desert, full of big jumps. In Group B, quite challenging. Best to learn it in something chuckable or truckable. Tokyo Expressway is GT Sport's only city location, but it does have six different variants. Central, East and South, all with an inner and outer loop. Sadly, Tokyo Extreme Racer fans, we cannot race on the whole 14.8 km C1 in a circular route. We can have six tracks loosely inspired by the C1 route. The central loop is very cramped and short and better for low powered cars. The east loop is good for high power because it has a huge straight. South is very technical and has a really weird pit and it was added in an update. Also added in an update is Circuit de saint -Croix. Um, Let's stop trying to speak French. Circuit de Croissant backwards is very big got three layouts called A, B, and C for some reason. A is 9.4 k's, B is 7, and C is 10.8 kilometers long. So they're long tracks with very smooth and incredibly wide roads set around a big French lake, and they've got a nice suspension bridge, but it's so big, 20 cars does not fill it. It has 32 grid slots, and even 32 bike grid slots. Also added in updates was three road track layouts for Sardinia, also known as A, B, and C, unfortunately. A is the big one, it's 5Ks in a bit, and it has a stop sign at one corner. It's got corners, I don't know. B is the fun one, it's got lots of hills, and C is the short one. Last but not least for new original tracks, Northern Isle Speedway is basically Bristol Motor Speedway, but not exactly. Again, there's no NASCARs to race here, but this is a future classic. It's a fun half-mile bowl. One returning original track did come in an update, but it's a 30-kilometer-long testing sausage called Special Stage Route X, and hey, 
It is great for slipstream battles. I have had good fun racing in competitive online ranked daily races at Route X. On both of the two weeks where 4GTs at Route X was the daily race of the week. Two weeks of the last 198. And that's an unfortunate limitation of this daily race system. It's not about what you want to do, it's about what is offered. A, B or C, chocolate, vanilla, strawberry. There are only three options for daily races that change each week. I would say they should call them weekly races, but then there'd be confusion with the Manufacturer Series and Nations Cup that are actually held weekly, whereas the daily races are held every 20 or 30 minutes. All day, every day for a week. And then change, uh, whatever. Hey look, a daily race victory. Rudex is interesting when it comes up in a daily race. It's a very rare event. And these other interesting events, like Audi TTs at BB Raceway, make me think that surely we could have more than three options each week. There's so much great content here, but most of it's so underutilized. So many cars they're not using. And the dirt and oval tracks so rarely come up. Adjusting your brake balance to get out of turn one is the only key to BB, by the way. Anyway, race A is road cars in one make races, but race B and C are always for racing machines. From group one, two, three, and four, generally. B is the short one, C is the long one with pit stops. So say you go to race B and you get group 4 racing. Group 4 is based on GT4 class racing from the real world, except only very loosely. There are some real GT4 class cars, such as the Porsche Cayman GT4 Club Sport. What's that? There's Porsche in Gran Turismo? Yes, it only took 20 years. And now we've lost Lotus due to a licensing disagreement. They'll be back for 7, I'm sure. Group 4 is lightened production cars with a wing at the back, racing tyres and 3 to 400 horsepower. They're not very fast in a straight line, but they can get around just about any circuit faster than any road car because racing tyres, they have so much grip. And there's a lot of variety in Group 4. There's 26 different manufacturers to choose from, and all of their cars achieve the same sort of speed in very different ways. There are mid-engine rear-wheel drive cars, like this Ferrari 458, four-wheel drive cars, like the Mitsubishi Lancer Evo 10, or that Lamborghini Huracan behind me, and also front-engine rear-wheel drive cars, like the Ford Mustang, and front-engine front-wheel drive cars, like the Volkswagen Scirocco. A Mazda 6 and a Bugatti Veyron can race together in Group 4. There's 28 cars from 26 different brands. Hey, which two manufacturers got two cars? Well, Toyota? They have the 86 and the Supra, but you can't actually get the Supra because it was a reward for a survey. And Renault, sorry, Renault Sport, also double dips because there's the Renault Sport Megane Group 4, just an ordinary Megane with more power on a wing, front engine, French wheel drive, and the Megane Trophy from 2011, which is a mid-engine, rear-wheel drive, carbon fibre racing car. It could have been a single spec car, but then it would languish in Group X, unable to race with any friends. So it was put into Group 4. And all of these cars can play along together thanks to BOP, balance of performance. Normally the Megane Trophy is too fast for Group 4, so with BOP it runs with 7% less power. But it's also much too light, so with BOP it runs with 219 kilos of ballast, or 70 house bricks. Problem solved. You can drive the cars in single player without the BOP, but online it's needed to maintain a balanced playing field. They used to update the BOP quite frequently to keep any one car from being too dominant. It may not always seem like it works because front wheel drive cars seem to win every Group 4 race. My theory is that it's because of pseudo metagaming, where people think they're metagaming because they look up what is the fastest Group 4 car, and a very fast player tells them that they've been dominant in front wheel drive cars. And so, they choose the front-wheel drive cars and practice with them a lot, and then win because the other people in the lobby are slower. And also the front-wheel drive cars handle better. Wait, what? No, that just undoes everything I said. I don't know. Nerf Scirocco. More rarely, you will see events for Group 2, which is the Japanese GT500 class of Super GT. Three cars from 2008 and three cars from 2016. They should probably be two separate groups, since they perform so differently, but oh well. They're very fast touring cars. Group B is an even rarer group to see. It's the only rally cars in the game, loosely based on Group B rally, which was famous for being way too fast and dangerous. 
Most unusually, the only non-fiction car in this class is the Audi Sport Quattro S1, and it's the Pikes Peak version, not the Group B specification from real life. There's no Lancia Delta S4 or Peugeot 205 T16, but there are several modern cars reimagined as Group B machines, like an Evo 10 Lancer and a Ford Mustang. Or there's Group 3, probably the main group of Gran Turismo Sport, certainly the one in which most of the competitions are held. And it's based on GT3 class racing, more serious, more prestigious and more focused. Everything here is rear wheel drive with 5 to 600 horsepower. It's a mix of real GT3 class cars with also some older GTE, GT2 and GT1 cars wearing more ballast, and some original cars like the beautifully amazing Mazda RX Vision rotary powered thingy and that Beetle Group 3 which is jumping all over the place because you know Australian Wi-Fi. Most people's connections are fairly stable and I've never run across a American or European because in sport mode I'm locked to the Asia Oceania region. I can only race with people who are within a reasonable distance of submarine cable which guarantees a good ro oh. Some of the players I've met in GT Sport seem to have forgotten the core tenets of racing etiquette school, which is a pair of two minute videos. In the first one, a British man says, Sportsmanship is about not doing things that make you look bad. In the second video, it is explained, Breaking too late makes you look bad, and crashing into people is bad. And most importantly, breaking too late, causing yourself to become a missile and crash into other people, ruining their race and yours, is a thing that makes you look bad. This type of driving mistake often happens when you are a beginner, so be careful and develop spatial awareness. That's all they teach you in racing etiquette. They could have just said, try not to drive like a savage orc and watch out for those who do. It's not a very in-depth or long etiquette program. It's more like a laser tag briefing video. Don't run, don't hit people, don't lie on the floor, have fun, and don't do a combat roll, you idiot, you'll break the vest. Don't want to deal with the hassles of online multiplayer? Well, for single players, you've got license tests and mission challenges, which are like licenses, but more race-focused and a lot longer. Try not to crash when you're 23 minutes in. And there's also circuit experience, which is exactly like license tests, but there's a lot more of them. You're given a car and some helpful instructions and are told to aim for gold times in each sector of a track and then a full one lap attack. You get gold in every sector and the one lap attack and you get a prize car. Chosen at random from the wheel. Could be the Diablo, it could be the R18 or the NSX or the Sprinter Trueno. Well, it is one of the cheapest cars in the game, but it's still a nice car. And you know what you can do with it? Now, thanks to updates, you can race it against a Corolla 11 in split screen. Decide which is the better AE86. Split screen mode is not very good in GT Sport, unfortunately. For starters, you only get a quarter of the screen each. And here's what's a real shame. You can't choose how many laps you want to do. Want a particularly short race or quite a long endurance race? no option to do it in split screen. You can still have a lot of fun messing around, but the lack of options in split screen mode is really quite disheartening. But not nearly as disheartening as what's happened to the single player experience. Once you've done the license tests and driving missions and circuit experience, you'll have over 50 cars and millions of credits and not much to do with them. Because, well, they want to just give you all these cars so you can enter most online races. For offline, or really quasi-offline racing, there was only arcade mode until GT League events were added into the game incrementally. I have a few problems with GT... Okay, I have a lot of problems with the GT League in this game. But first, I have a problem with Group 1. It's nice that 80s and 90s Group C machines can race together with 2010s LMP1s and Vision GT cars from the theoretical future, but it's not very balanced, especially offline where there's no bop. Why are there no subgroups? This problem gets even worse for the N-class road cars, but I'll get to that later. There are still classic events in GT League, like MX-5s at Tsukuba, but until you get to professional, there's no challenge, except for the new challenge of the AI being either blind or homicidal. Not sure which one it is. But sometimes they just ruin your race right at the end. Sometimes I ruin my own race right at the end, 
When I overshoot the last turn at Big Willow, lose control, slide into the pits backwards, and crash into 18 people. Miraculously, nobody was injured. I have been injured in the past. Here's a reenactment. Oh, I'm driving my KDM crossbow. The AI and the Veneno is getting close. Getting very close. He hit me at 2.30. The brakes are doing nothing. It's all over, Red Rover. I'm going over now. As fearless in death as he was in life. At least being occasionally obliterated by careless AI adds some excitement to the race. For the most part, GT League is devastatingly boring because every single event in the game has a single file rolling start with cars spread hundreds of meters apart and driving very slowly, just waiting for you to overtake them within the allotted laps. It's how racing games worked in the 80s, sure, when they were 2D, but come on! The races could be much more exciting and interesting than this, and I know because the game has a custom race mode, where you can actually still have grid starts. Fantastic! The classic honk 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 beep, but now with 20 cars on the grid, not 6. The races can be as long as you like, and you can set fuel use and tyre multipliers for endurance racing. It almost makes the GT League in this game redundant. I say almost because you can't really pick your opponents. You can only pick which group they come from, and then the game will decide what opponents it wants to give you. And this mostly causes problems when you want to race in Group N. And what is Group N? Well, if you thought Group 1, 3, and 4 were big, Group N is for road cars. All of them. As of update 1.66, 168 cars are in Group N. But it is, of course, not just one giant group. That wouldn't make any sense. It's broken into divisions. But instead of the usual categories and themes like hot hatchbacks, 90s Japanese sports cars, 60s American muscle, and so on, they are power divisions, where cars are assigned based on their nearest 100 metric horsepower, and nothing else is taken into account. Not a car's age, suspension type, drivetrain, torque curve, or even weight. Evo 10 Lancer, N300. E-Type Jag, N300. KTM Crossbow, N300. Panzer IV, N300, if it was in the game. Relax, it has sports hard treads. Every single vehicle on Earth is eligible for N-Class, unless it is a Vision Gran Turismo car, electric, or too much of a race car. And what exactly defines too much of a race car is very nebulous. Okay, the Mark 1 GT40 is absolutely a purpose-built race car, but it is road legal because that's how race cars were in the 60s, so bam, stamp, N300. Renault 8 Gordini. Passenger car, used in racing, absolutely road legal and certainly not a purpose-built racing machine like the GT40, but nope, it's it's too much, send it to Group X. I like single-spec racing in Gordinis, but it's not fair that they can't race with everything else in N100, they'd fit in fine there. The Mazda Roadster Touring Car is an extremely fast racing modified MX-5, the same one from GT5 and 6, teeps of fun, I thought it would be a single-spec car, but nope. It's in N200, where it races against cars that are half a ton heavier and don't have downforce or roll cages. Ugh. A Toyota SFR racing concept. Hmm, yes, that is also quite a race car. N300. <sighs> the mind boggles. The Pagani Zonda R is an ultra-limited production, track-only, screaming V12 beast. It is, of course, in Group X. That makes sense. The Aston Martin Vulcan is an ultra-limited production, track-only, screaming V12 beast in N800. But they're both equally road illegal. I... Ah, oh, whatever. Even if it was allowed in to the N classes, the N classes make no sense. Especially down the bottom in N300, where you have cars that are 700 kilos against cars that are 1700 kilos. You can't bop them. There's such a diverse range. It's not apples and oranges. It's apples, oranges, bananas, ravioli, tungsten. You... You... Ugh. N divisions don't make a whole lot of sense. You know what else doesn't make a whole lot of sense? When you say, I'd like to race against N400 cars, and the game generates a list of N500, N600, and N700 cars for you to race against. Detuned to N400, but I don't want to race against detuned exotic supercars. I want to race... Ugh, never mind. Okay, so maybe it's best to not let the AI choose opponents. Just have a one-make race. That's an option. You can have a one-make race in any vehicle. So I set up a 10-minute endurance race for classic minis and overtook 
everyone in the field in three minutes. And then I parked my Mini and let them all pass, and very almost overtook them all again. Ah, oh, well that explains the extremely spaced out single file rolling starts for all the campaign. It's because the AI can't drive, they need that much of a head start. They are terribly slow. Not in all cars. Some cars they're pretty fast. Performance is really, really uneven. Toyota 86s? The AI can drive them. Suzuki Swifts? They cannot. They're hopeless. Or maybe it's because I'm running the track clockwise. Maybe they just don't know how to do BB in reverse. But these are the things you find out when you're experimenting with custom race mode. I found out another thing the AI don't know how to do is uh, drive at all on Horse Thief Mile given a grid start. Because the grid start sort of extends into the pit lane area, so half the grid races, and the other half are doomed to ram into the pit wall forever for some reason. Grand Tomato. On Horse Thief Mile 2, the reverse layout, this doesn't happen. Well, the trailer did say if I wanted real racing, it had to be driver against driver, human against human. But then the humans make me wonder if the guy on the cover is celebrating or screaming in anguish. Of course, not all racers immediately descend into barbaric slaughter. Sometimes you load into a lobby, prepared to race, and you do your warm-up. You read the hellos and g'days and all that punctilio, and you're waiting for the race to load. Um, oh, you disconnected. <laughs> and then that's it. No race. When's the next race see? Five o'clock! That's a long time. It's 26 minutes away. So you have to go do something else. I can't go into the Nations Cup or Manufacturer Series because it's not on on that particular day. It never does seem to be on. But I'm not usually playing at midnight on Wednesday or Sunday. Quick note, for daily races there are three regions. Asia Oceania, North and South America, and Europe, Middle East, Africa, Russia, India. But for the very serious Nations Cup and Manufacturer Series, it's split into five regions. Asia and Oceania are separate, North and South America are separate, and EMEA still covers the rest of the entire Earth. Point is, most players are never going to join the Manufacturer Series or Nations Cup. Most players never even touch sport mode according to Kudos Prime statistics. And that's probably because it's just so different to what Gran Turismo usually is. This isn't a race that you have any chance of winning unless you are an extremely determined driven person, at least for race C. Of course on an oval anything could happen, but here in an endurance race for 25 minutes? Look, I'm 8 seconds off the pace, I'm just trying to maintain my position, and I was killed by the rumble strip. Which is discouraging, and now I still have to race for another 20 minutes trying not to let that happen again. At least I can pause and let auto drive get me out. You can pause for quite a while. If you're close enough to the bathroom, you could probably run over really fast, have a pee and come back. But you will be disqualified if you pause too long. And it counts your pause time across the whole race. I paused for just two seconds a little bit later on in the race, and then was immediately disqualified. Ah, who cares? It's not like they were going to pay me much anyway. Which is a really weird point. Bizarrely, even though there's such a huge emphasis on sport mode, the rewards for the player are poultry. No, you don't get chicken. A pol poultry with an A. Oh, never mind. They're pathetically small. If you win a sport mode race, which is really hard, you might make 80 to 100,000 credits. Place around the middle, 30 to 50,000. Which may sound like more than the 13,000 on offer here, but keep in mind this event is only 5 minutes long. And also, what's the point of doing the beginner events? Skip straight to professional, you'll unlock it when you reach level 20, which you can do just by doing circuit experience. And then, those events pay around 200,000 credits a race. And endurance events pay over 400,000 credits a race, but they're all roughly one hour long. And if you can make 1 to 1.8 million credits per hour in professional league, there's no point doing endurance, or beginner, or amateur, or sport mode, or anything else. There's no point in doing anything but a couple of professional league races if you want to make millions of credits. Not that you need them to buy most cars. My garage is full of cars with pink spots indicating they were prize cars, or really gift cars, that I didn't pay for. 36 from circuit experience, I think 16 from licenses and missions, and at least 200 random daily workout cars, and none of these can be sold for credits. But you can delete them, hooray! Now collecting cars is like managing my emails. Wonderful, fantastic, I can delete 
duplicate cars. Delete. That's disgusting. In every other Gran Turismo game, the garage is a sacred place where I look at cars that I've earned or bought and I can remember the history of each one. Here I can tell, thanks to the pink spot, the history of most of these cars is I got it at random for playing the game for 15 minutes that day. Because the game encourages you to. It's a good deal. Pay 15 minutes, enter the random lottery, get a car. I wish they'd just not have this system at all, but if it gives me a chance of winning this mirror that I keep seeing on the menus and thinking, wow, I really want that mirror, but... You know, it's the same mirror that was in GT5 and 6. Of course, it's the prototype. It won Pebble Beach. It's at concourse quality. There are no crumbs in this mirror. I still want it. But if I don't win it from a lottery, I have to buy it with 15 million credits. And to get 15 million credits takes, with the fastest grinding setup, 8 hours. A 12 minute race at an oval, 40 times. And that's assuming you get the clean race bonus every time. The grind is horrible and the economy is tremendously off balance. It doesn't seem so at first, you know, most road cars are some sort of reasonable price. There's 120 cars under 200,000 credits, and then the racing cars are priced by what group they're in. Group 4 cars are 350,000, group 3 cars are 450,000, group 1 cars are 1 million credits, which sounds like a lot, but the 787B has never been this easy to acquire. I'm sold, 1 million credits, no problem. Also, all the Vision GT cars are 1 million credits, making the Bugatti Vision GT half the price of a Veyron, and the Daihatsu VGT just right. Really though, I love the Copen Racing Jacket. It is... it should have its own one-make race series. There is a Copen RJ one-make race in Mission Challenges, but I completed it years ago. I mean, there's no need to go back. And then in GT League, there are two sets of races open for VGT cars, one for the slower half and one for the fastest ones, and like, there's no point separating them like that. There are so many differences in performance. The 2X is powered by lasers. It really can't compete with anything else. It is... it's powered by lasers. Anyway, the cheapest 120 cars, that's everything under 200,000 credits, could be yours for 8.3 million but actually far less in practice, because every day you log in and drive 42 kilometers, you get a free one. And the gift wheel will give you heaps of group four and three and B cars as well. But when we get to the expensive end, cars that cost one million credits, there's over 50 of them. And you occasionally get them on the gift wheel too. I've received quite a few group one cars and a couple of VGTs from the gift wheel worth one million credits. And winning those saves you a bit of grinding time, but it's the 30 cars over a million credits that keep me coming back begrudgingly spinning the wheel. The 1.8 million credit Countach, or the twice as expensive McLaren P1 GTR, which is still nothing compared to the 10 of these cars in the 8 digit range, like the Mura. You'll remember them from GT5 and 6, the 20 million credit whales, the Ford Mark IV, the Ferrari 330 P4, and the never raced Jaguar XJ13. And returning from GT6, the Ferrari 250 GTO, which is like a Da Vinci painting in that it's a work of art and a store of wealth for billionaires. In the 15 million credit range, we have, of course, the Mura prototype, the new to the series, Jaguar D-Type. The Shelby Cobra Daytona is also 15 million credits now, up from 4.5 million in GT6. And the Ferrari 250 GT Berlinetta Paso Corto has casually appreciated 5 million credits. In the 10 million range, we have the new to the series, Aston Martin DB3S, and of course, the Giulia TZ2. And I should mention the 11th most expensive car in the game, the Corvette Stingray Racer. It was 500,000 credits in GT6, and they added a zero. Just because, you know. Now it's 100 times the price of a C3 Stingray. So there are 10 cars in this game that cost 157,500,000 credits together, which is far more than every other car in the game combined. And like nearly every car in the game, if you want to drive it, you have to buy it. Arcade mode only offers eight rental cars. Even though this game's allegedly not about collecting cars. There's an awful lot of car collecting to be done in it, and it's a horribly tedious process. And by the time you've finally got the most expensive handful, GT7 or Avatar 2 will be out. For those with more dollars than cents, in July 2018, Sony added almost all the game's cars to the PlayStation Store, where you can buy them with real cash instead of credits. The prices do not scale at all, at $15 for a 10 million credit car, 
A 25,000 credit card should be 2 cents, so yeah, it just doesn't work. And what about the 8 cards over 10 million credits? Are they 20 to 30 dollars? No, they're not actually available for purchase at all. That's good! Great, the microtransactions were stupid anyway. And if you think the same, you actually have the option to turn them off in the game's menus. You can turn off the ability to see that you have the option to pay real money for these cars. What a feature! When will it come to EA, Take-Two and Ubisoft games? If you really do want to spend more money to help yourself get expensive cars faster, the Lewis Hamilton Time Trial Challenge has enormous credit prizes if you can beat the target times. I haven't bought it yet, but I might. The 100 million plus credit incentive is... Tempting. It sounds to me like a much more interesting way to spend my time than doing this 300 more times, even if it does cost 12 bucks. Though anyone wanting to reach level 50 within their lifetime will have to do this at least once a day for a year or so. Keep in mind, the only reason that you would be grinding to level 50 would be if you wanted all the trophies. And also keep in mind that another one of the game's trophies requires you to win 91 sport mode races. Personally, I've entered 100 and won 5. I don't know if I could put up with entering another 800, 900 more races to get that many victories. I mean, sport mode's growing on me, but I don't know if I'll get that many done before the game closes, and I don't know if I can put up with the orcs for that long. I do know that I seriously enjoy qualifying for daily races, though, because you get all week to improve on your lap time. You can find tents that you forgot you could find at the cutting, and when you do that you'll find you go through Quarry Corner faster, which makes your whole lap faster, if you can do the rest of it right, and that's the real trick to Bathurst. The rest of it. The second half is so challenging. Everything after Skyline is just, ugh, a nightmare. Now, here we are, we're coming up to it. Past the parks. Alright. Skyline's here. Break. Going through the S's. That could have been a lot better. That was pretty sloppy. Didn't do too badly on the dipper though. Oh, the thrill of self-improvement. The thrill of Bathurst. This is great. What's not great though, is my performance here. Through Forest's elbow, eh, that was rubbish. That was so bad. Now my ghost is going to catch me on Conrod. Oh well, you got to keep trying. Got to persevere. A few laps later I'd shaved a few tenths off, but was still looking to try and get a low 214, as my optimal said. Then, I touch the sides. Much like Operation, the key to Bathurst is to not touch the sides. Most of the time, when I'm playing time trials, it's not to qualify, it's just for fun. I love doing time trials in Gran Turismo Sport, experimenting with all the game's many car and track combinations. Of course, there's not quite as many as I'd like, but there's still thousands of combinations, and they're all fun to try, and thanks to this session best option in the bottom right, I can look at my optimal time when I'm driving and know which sectors I'm not doing well in and it really helps me push myself to get better lap times. I love this feature they've added. And I love that you can change pages and then change your traction control or brake balance on the fly or look at a radar so you know if someone's going to ram you online. Not every option is there that I'd like, of course I can't change music volume while I'm there so I have to go all the way back to the main menu to do that. And you can't turn the HUD off, you have to pause the game, go all the way down to the bottom, hit detailed settings, hit the top option and press down twice, but then look! The game with its HUD off is amazingly immersive. It's like VR, but $400 cheaper. If I'm not aiming to set, you know, an incredibly fast time, if I just want to have fun in time trial mode, HUD off, definitely. It's fantastically beautiful and immersive. I should mention as well, if you don't think you like hot lapping, just do a few laps of Tsukuba. Tsukuba is a perfect beginner's hot lapping track, because it's very short and you can do a few laps and... Wow, the sky is really pretty anyway. The ability to look around with the right stick, if you're driving with the triggers, is another fantastic feature, especially with the HUD off in the interior. Now that I can look left and slightly down, I can watch myself change gear in the E-Type. Although it's quite difficult, if you push the stick too far down you'll look backwards, but oh, it is such a beautiful thing. Why can't I just widen my field of view a bit? If only I could, then I wouldn't have to keep fiddling with the camera, trying to watch myself change gears and go off track.
You can adjust the interior view a bit, forward and back, up and down, but only a little bit, and you can't change the field of view. Still, it's great that there's this option, but it's a bit of a pain in the neck to have to keep adjusting it every single time you change cars. The Volkswagen Samba bus has a beautiful interior, but it is very, very hard to see the instruments. Still, just looking around the interior as you drive very slowly, there's plenty of time to appreciate the views. Even the back view. Wow. It really is a 23 window bus. So many windows. L look at all those windows. What Polyphony have achieved with their car models and lighting technology is staggering. In the BMW Z8, in rear view, you can see reflections on the headrest chrome. Detailed reflections. It's... Ugh. I mean, some reflections have quite a low resolution, but in such a tiny space as the chrome bits, they look... Mm, it, unbelievable. Another beautiful feature of this game is that across most modes, you can switch cars without going back to the menu in one second. Which is definitely a contributing factor in me trying out so many cars in time trial mode. You can also change tracks without going back to the menu. It doesn't take one second though, it takes about 30, but still, that's another fantastic feature. Here's what's not. They've removed the data logger from the game, and I continually have problems loading ghosts. I loaded the ghost of the 911 Carrera RS. I'm comparing it with the 911 GT3 in the daily race qualifying lap. I'm trying to see which of the 911s is faster. Because you can do that, you can load up a ghost and have it race alongside your other best lap ghost. No matter how many times I tried, that particular ghost file would not show up. That car should be appearing here, but it's it's not. I could get other ghosts to work, I could get a Dodge Challenger ghost to work, but I don't need to compare my lap time to the much slower Dodge Challenger. It's not... Ugh. About half of all the ghosts I've saved do not load correctly. I don't know if it's just a bug for me or what, but... It's not as annoying as losing connection to the server. That is something I can at least blame on the design of this game. Why does it have to be always online? Reconnecting to the server and having this little message about, you know, how it's very important that this has happened and you can't save and now we're going to try and reconnect again when you exit. It's... Ugh. Reminds me of Just Cause 3. The worst part of Just Cause 3. Reconnecting to the stupid server every time you went to go to the map. Anyway. At least the menu music makes me happy again. And the history section, the museum. You can learn so many things about so many cars from most of the game's manufacturers. Most of the major ones have a museum section. Ford doesn't for some reason, but Ferrari, Lamborghini, Toyota, Subaru... A whole lot of them have museum sections, and they're interlinked with this timeline of various other historical events from all sorts of things. Sporting events, scientific discoveries, the release of the movie Intolerance, the Russian Revolution, the, the history of jazz music, there's a lot of jazz facts. The history of the internal combustion engine, the history of Felix the Cat, that's important, you know. 93 years later you can learn about iPads, when Rafael Nadal won the Grand Slam, when Tesla started, um, various things. IPv4, the Toyota FJ Cruiser. Oh, it teases me when there's so many cars they show off that aren't in the game. I really hope the FJ Cruiser is in Gran Turismo 7. That would be a dream come true. There are plenty of great Toyotas in the game. The GR Yaris was added in an update. That is probably the most important. The GR Yaris is so good. Also Rain. Rain was added in an update, but only for four tracks. Only Red Bull Ring, Spa, Tokyo Central and Tokyo East. And the inner and outer loops of Tokyo Central and East are the only tracks that can be run at night in the rain. Which is a real shame because it's beautiful. If I could play every track at night in the rain, I would. But as it stands in this game, there's only static time of day options. You just get six or seven different times of day per track and they're beautiful but they're mostly between dawn and dusk, and the few tracks that do have night options, you know, they're static night options. There's no stars in the sky as well, which is a real shame. GT6 had the most beautiful, dynamic star maps. And now we're back to starless skies with a blurry, smudgy moon. <sighs> well, I can say the replay camera is beautiful. 
Replays do run letterboxed at 30 FPS, so they can throw more post-processing effects on, just like the Order 1886, but the results are incredibly beautiful. And of course, you can still pause those replays and freely walk around the track in frozen time to take beautiful photos. This game's photo mode is just as excellent as it was in GT5 and 6. Well, actually better, except for the one feature that's missing, 3D photography. Because in GT5 and 6, you could take MPO stereoscopic 3D photos and now you couldn't see them unless you had a 3D TV, and I don't. But you could export them and put them into a stereoscope. Ah, uh, whatever. Point is, get your Spy Kids 3D DVD case, put your red cyan glasses on, and have a look at some of these that I took. I know 3D TVs went out of style, but 3D photos never do. It's such a cool feature, and it's a shame GT Sport doesn't have .mpo export options or any ability to make 3D photos. I guess you could. Oh, oh that one's not very good. Sorry about that. I'll take it off screen now. I suppose you could make a 3D photo if you took a photo and then tried to move six centimeters to the side and take another one, but it's very hard to know when you've moved six centimeters. It'd be very difficult to do it properly. Anyway, GT Sport is now rendering a very pretty photo. It can take a while if you have a lot of cars in the shot. This is a worst case scenario, rendering a 4K photo with heaps of LaFerraris in it. I know from my 10 years of taking photos of cars in GT5 and 6 that you should always render the 2K shot first and then try 4K if you're really happy with it. See, that was all right, but should have done 2K first. Now, scapes. Race photography is the same as it's always been, but scapes is very different to the location-based photography that was in the game before. You don't walk around these locations. You have... You're essentially inserting game models into real-world photo backdrops that have lighting data. As you can see, the sun's position is saved and you can see the avatar's shadow on the car. What they've achieved here is amazing. Now, you can move the cars around, but you can't move around in the world because these aren't in-game worlds. These are photos with lots of lighting data. Sure, you can't walk around them like the Kyoto location in 5 and the wind farm and museum in 6, but the results are incredibly beautiful, and the quantity of them. There are not 10, not 15, but 1,235 scapes in Gran Turismo Sport. If you like car photography, there are a lot of locations, and when I say a lot, I mean a lot. And when I say, when I say a lot, I mean a lot, I mean when I say a lot, I mean a lot. Which is redundant and recursive, but there's a lot. None of them are in Australia, but maybe there'll be some in Gran Turismo 7. For now, we've got lots of scapes in cities, we've got scapes on cliffs, we've got scapes where the subject is very far away. Where is my mini? Oh, there it is. See, it's on the road. You pose your car within the scene, adjust its lights, adjust its wheel angle, but then you can also make heaps and heaps of camera adjustments. Exposure, colour temperature, colour correction. Even with just those three, I was able to turn this scene into pretty much night. And, oh, In the Black of Night is such a good song. But there's heaps of filter options. I haven't gotten the on here, but you can make great things. This is now my desktop wallpaper. I love this shot. And I was able to get that wallpaper and various wallpapers for my phone because you can export these photos directly to a USB storage device, as always. It's been possible since Gran Turismo 4's photo mode. There's always been challenges, though. Of course, for GT4 and Tourist Trophy, you can only export your photos if you have a USB drive that is compatible with the PS2's ancient USB 1.1 port. For GT5 and 6, it's actually really easy, so long as you had a FAT32 drive, which we all do. For Gran Turismo Sport, the new challenge is finding a USB drive that fits in the PS4's stupid USB cave. But as long as your USB drive is you know, less than 1.8 centimeters thick and fits in the cave and has XFAT or FAT32, it should be fine. Oh, but you have to move them across one at a time. You can't do bulk export like in GT5 and 6 because the PS4 can't you know, hold photos. It doesn't only do everything like the PS3 did. Photo exporting is minor. There are so many major problems. Tuning. 
has been gutted and replaced, and much like a disappointingly expensive restaurant meal, it's just a pair of sliders. What, that's it? Two sliders? One for power and one for weight? I've never understood sliders anyway. People pay more money for two or three little small burgers than one big one what, just because they're cute? We have a cuteness tax for little burgers? But no, the sliders in GT Sport, they're killing me. The weight slider, okay, I understand that. That's for ballast. And the weight reduction upgrades we always had are functionally the same as the weight slider. But the power slider cannot replace mufflers, sports ECUs, port grinding, engine balancing, increasing displacement, turbochargers. Oh, for 20 years we had all of those things, and now a power slider. For five years in GT Sport, just a power slider. And power sliding around dirt, on an unrelated topic, but related to what you see here. Oh, it would be nice to race against AI, and sure, I'm racing against 11 other cars here in this GT League event. But in arcade and custom race, I can only have one opponent. Even though I can have 11 in the campaign, I can't make a custom race with more than one opponent. That is so frustrating. When all the other tracks let you have custom races with 19 other cars and tyre wear and fuel usage, these dirt tracks all have pit lanes too, but there are no events and no option to use fuel and tyres on them. Oh. I get that maybe they're there for future-proofing. You'd better not throw out these things. It's time to stop throwing out old art assets. Gran Turismo Sport has so many great things in it, and after losing so many tracks and cars, we can stop now. We've reached a point where the quality is good enough. Yes, some trees need updating, but give this dynamic time of day and weather, we can keep Sardinia windmills forever. There is no need to keep throwing things away. What few things we have in Gran Turismo Sport, I've appreciated for years while I wait for Seven, but oh, every car they add is a treasure. This Mitsubishi GTO, I'm so glad they added it. It's heaps of fun. I've driven over 250 of the game's 330 cars. I love them all. They are all so incredibly detailed, so incredibly great to drive. And there's been some excellent additions. This is the first Gran Turismo game with the Ferrari F50 or the De Tommaso Pantera, for example. There are four new Impreza WRX models that we didn't have before. And there's 11 Porsches and a roof. Most of the new Vision Gran Turismo cars have been excellent. A lot of them were carried through from GT6 and I really thought when Vision GT started in 2013 that it would be just for GT6 with maybe a few things carried over to GT7, which turned out to be GT Sport. And, and as it stands in 2021, a few of them are going to be carried through to GT7. The Lamborghini VGT was announced to come out in Spring 2020, but missed that uh, by a year and nothing has been heard since, I suppose. We'll see it maybe at the end of 2021, maybe in 2022. Nike has had a Vision GT car on the card since 2013. It'll soon be 2022, the, the Nike One 2022 from Gran Turismo 4 should exist by next year, which will be pretty interesting. Anyway, back to normal cars. It's a real shame about how many did not return though. There's over 200 premium car models from GT6 that aren't in sport, even though they were supposedly future-proof and excellent they are. They're beautiful 500,000 polygon models at their highest level of detail and many of them return. We've got the Ferrari 458 that was in GT5 and 6. It's still beautiful in sport. Maybe some changes were made under the hood to physically based rendering, new shaders and whatnot. Of course all the cars now have indicators, blinkers, turn signals, whatever you want to call them, which is an excellent feature. Props to Polyphony Digital for developing the best car lights ever seen anywhere. The brake lights, indicators, headlights, fog lamps, reversing lights, all of them are so incredibly detailed and they light up in such excellent ways. So you can tell with older cars, pre-LED, the way they slowly warm up the bulbs, it's... Oh, it is amazing. 
But of course, every part of this Mazda Roadster model is amazing. It's modelled down to the windshield wiper fluid nozzles. Is that why some of the other premium models didn't come back? Have we reached a new level of super duper premium? If improvements have been made to the models of the Ferrari 458 or F40 or 512 Berliner Boxer since Gran Turismo 5, I haven't noticed them. Surely they're the same models, right? Maybe a new shader here or there, but I don't see why they would return and yet not the 599, F430, 430 Scuderia, SP1. Oh, so many Ferraris that could be in the game, and not just Ferrari, it applies to every single brand. Aston Martin, yeah, we've got the DB11, but at what cost? The DB9 and the V12 Vanquish are out. Lamborghini has the Aventador and Aventador SV and also the Huracan, but we've lost the Murcielago and Gallardo. I'm seeing a pattern here, it's like the GT Sport car list was looking to update everything and anything from 2007 to 13 was not cool. Of course the Huayra is from 2013 and it's very cool, but there's nothing to update it with. I'm talking about manufacturers that have new cars replacing old. The 6th generation Mustang is here, oh goodbye 5th gen Mustang, even though GT6 just added the Bosch 302 and the Shelby GT500, nah they gotta go, they're not cool anymore. The McLaren MP4-12C is outdated now that we've got the 650S, but it stayed in the game, which is very unfair since we've lost the Lexus LFA, the Alfa Romeo 8C, the Audi R8 with the 5.2 V10, the 4.2 V8 came back, which is really really weird. But the V10 model's gone. I could go on about the oddities of the car list forever, but this video is already feature length, so why do that? Of course the car list is odd. This game was intended to be a preview. Uh, well, not a prologue. Certainly not a prologue, but just a game in between games. It's just that the gap in between was not two or three years, but five. We didn't expect it would be such an incredibly long wait with Gran Turismo Sport, but that's what it's been. A wait. A wait for cars to come back. A wait for tracks to come back. Yeah, good, they added Special Stage Route X. It still confounds me that that was the only track from any Gran Turismo game that returns in GT Sport. When Midfield and Apricot Hill were re-added to Gran Turismo 6 after being absent from 5, I thought that was the direction we were heading in. I thought maybe we'd get Special Stage Route 11 back next, or, or Complex String, or Costa de Amalfi, or Seattle, or something. And their absence is disappointing, but maybe next time. GT Sport's undoings are all the little decisions that just don't make sense. And not the ones related to nostalgic content, but just content that makes sense. We've got racing carts, but no kart track. We've got a huge emphasis on online racing in various classes of racing cars, but we've cut all the Japanese GT300 cars that could have been their own group. We've still got paint chips, but you don't get paint chips anymore when you buy cars. You can't paint a car in any of its original colours. If you have a blue Ferrari and you would rather it be Rosso Corsa, there is no Rosso Corsa paint chip. There's green with flakes. But, ah, uh, it's, it's too weird. The, the mileage exchange, where you use a currency that exists only for buying helmets and poses and paint chips and toe stickers. Mileage is also what you use to upgrade, in inverted commas, your cars, so you can adjust the power and weight sliders a bit further in each direction. Ugh and mileage points are used to buy wheels and to buy safety cars. And what do you do with the safety cars? Well, you could maybe enter a roleplay lobby online and pretend to be the cop and enforce the speed limits. I like to drift my safety cars, and it's great that Gran Turismo Sport still has the same drift mode from GT5 and 6. But you know what? They've only got sector drift mode, and they've removed the ability to do full lap drift trials. Which is a real shame. I always preferred full lap drift, but I understand that sector based drifting was always the more competitive mode, and GT Sport being a competitive online game 
Surely that's what they'd have to use for drift competitions. But GT Sport has no drift competitions. Gran Turismo 6 had drift trials, online drift trials, every week. In Gran Turismo Sport we have a drift mode and a heavy online focus and no weekly drift of the week with a leaderboard? Why not? Sure, I can drift a GR Supra around Bathurst by myself, but I liked competing with the community to see if I could get within the top thousand drifters each week. They host regular official online time trials with leaderboards, but no drift trials. And while the time trials of GT6 had huge prizes, you could get millions of credits if you beat the gold target times, the time trials in GT Sport have no incentive to enter. Besides the leaderboard, and regular time trials and drift trials that aren't part of online competitions have no leaderboards. It's a far cry from Drive Club, which had the most sophisticated leaderboard system I'd ever seen. It's a real shame they're all closed now. What Gran Turismo Sport does have, for the first time, is a livery editor. Oh, how good it is to finally be able to cover cars in stickers. Big Gran Turismo shaped stickers. I haven't really gotten very used to it yet, it's complicated of course. But you have the primitive shapes, you can do anything. And besides that, of course, you have all sorts of other decals, real world logos and some fake ones as well. But with primitive shapes you can do anything. I never, I'll never forget that years ago, it must have been in Forza Motorsport 2, I was at my brother's house and we were racing against someone who had a Spongebob car. And I said, how did they get the Spongebob? And he said, well, they made it out of rectangles and circles. I said, that, person, that, that person's so talented. How'd they make Spongebob out of rectangles and circles? He's like, Spongebob's a rectangle. Like, yeah, but it, that's, that's really difficult. Point is, you could do that. You could make a Spongebob out of rectangles and circles, or you could import one because this livery editor lets you import SVG files, scalable vector graphics. Fantastic. It's a shame it doesn't take JPEGs or PNGs, but if you can find some vector graphics somewhere, probably Wikipedia. Wikipedia has lots of vector graphics, though most of them are coats of arms, flags, and graphs. But you could take those coats of arms and flags and graphs and stick them onto your car, if you so desired. When you're finally finished with your design, you upload it to the game's servers so you can use it. You can't use it unless you do that. This always online system, Ugh. Anyway, once you've done that, you can choose to share it or not. And the players who have shared their liveries have made some amazing things. There are some very creative people out there. There's also quite a lot of people who are just really obsessed with Monster Energy, of course, but some people have made outstanding car liveries. The problem is searching for those liveries is a real pain in the neck. You can find the most popular liveries from when the game launched, because they're the ones with the most likes, it's a section for those. And you can find liveries that were uploaded in the last week, but if you want to search for any particular word, you can do that, but you still have to then scroll through pages and pages of all the liveries relating to that word, sorted from newest to oldest not most relevant, you still have to go through lots of blank pages because the game makes a page for every week of the server's existence. So if there was a thing made one year ago, you have to click through 50 pages to get to it. I have a Pakari Sweat livery. I was lucky that the day I searched for Pakari Sweat years ago, Someone had made a Pakari Sweat suit livery. I forgot, you can make suit and helmet liveries as well. If you were to go looking for that now, you'd have to flick through hundreds of pages to get to it. When the community makes such great content that is so hard to find, it, oh, it's very frustrating. Searching through community content in a modern game should not be reminiscent of searching for stuff on the internet in the dial-up days. You know, the mid-90s to mid-2000s, when computers went And it was still easier to find stuff than it is to find certain liveries in GT Sport. So, 
In conclusion, Gran Turismo Sport has changed a lot since it launched, as far as content goes. Many things were added that no one could have possibly expected. Autopolis, Catalonia, Lewis Hamilton's 2017 Mercedes F1 car. On one hand, to receive all of this content in free updates seems like it should be commendable when compared to other games in the industry having multiple season passes. On the other hand, I can't reward mediocrity. This is the best-selling racing game franchise in the world, besides Mario Kart, so we should be able to expect more from it. We should be able to expect AI opponents that can at least provide the impression of a good race, rather than roll around the track leisurely, even on their hardest difficulty setting. We had better AI over 20 years ago on a console with 2 megabytes of RAM. We also had a rewarding, engrossing, rags to riches game structure, which has since been replaced by some license tests and then a roulette wheel that fills in the rest. Yes, updates added 301 GT League races and a little bit of Isamu Ohira's legendary music. But there's no reason to play these races because the game isn't structured like that. It's structured so that the best 48 drivers in the world can compete against each other in a sport, and the other 99.999% can watch. They even updated the intro movie to reflect this. Of course, the lowest echelons of sport mode are open to everyone, but they only seem to appeal to about a tenth of the player base. The tenth who were happy to do the same races all week in search of good racing. Racing for the sake of racing, not to win anything. If you look hard enough, you may even find a good race to be had in custom race mode. Although, chances are it'll be a one-make race. The AI can't be trusted to choose cars for themselves because the cars have been placed in ridiculous power divisions, and they're only really good at driving racing cars anyway. The years spent waiting for Gran Turismo Sport were quite long, but the years spent waiting with Gran Turismo Sport have been longer still. Years spent waiting for a Gran Turismo with a single player experience, with the cars and tracks we've come to love and expect, with tuning with a used car dealership, with Isamu Ohira's menu music, it's been years of waiting, but it hasn't been wasted time. It's a foundation for Gran Turismo 7 to build upon. There's lots of cars and tracks here. Just think, if Gran Turismo 7 just has lots more of this content and puts it in a better context, it's all set up to be a fantastic game. Context is everything. A 20 car grid start race in a Mazda 787B is one thing, in custom race mode in GT Sport, but if it were part of a championship, part of a great GT League mode, part of a game where you work your way up to the top starting in slow cars, used cars, tuned cars, part of something greater, not a toolbox, but Gran Turismo, I'd be as happy as the little green server indicator spot.